this. Sorry. Uh, for the second year running, we've uh, decided to move this event online. Once again, we're missing really how this event was always an opportunity for people from both jurisdictions on the island of Ireland and from further afield to come together in one physical location. We really are missing that lively hum of conversations between old friends and colleagues and the making of new acquaintances as people crossed from one jurisdiction into the other to attend this lecture. However, we hope that this online edition, this second online edition of the annual Sir George Quigley Memorial Lecture will nevertheless provide us all with a virtual space for the exchange of ideas. It's different, of course, but we can still use it as a kind of coming together, a collaborative effort to envision a space of cooperation that can help us to overcome some of the uncertainties provoked by the meandering course of the pandemic and of the shaping of the post-Brexit landscape. Why does the Centre for Cross-Border Studies hold this Sir George Quigley Annual Memorial Lecture now in its sixth year? Sir George Quigley's vision of what strong economic and business cooperation between the two parts of the island of Ireland can do as a vital element in any sustainable peace process in Northern Ireland is one that resonates with the Centre for Cross-Border Studies' own core mission to support, promote and advocate for improved North-South cooperation as an essential means of exploiting the enormous potential businesses, public bodies, local authorities, and communities in both parts of the island have to offer when they come together. It's a vision that shines a light on the natural connections between people and places that although separated by a border can nevertheless come together and create things that would be difficult if not impossible to achieve if they remain constrained within the limits of an administrative boundary. Sir George's vision saw cross-border cooperation as transcending political borders following a logic of expansive innovation and creativity that could not only bring mutual prosperity, but also increased understanding between those who engaged in such cooperation. It's for these reasons and in that spirit that the Centre for Cross-Border Studies decided to establish the annual Sir George Quigley Memorial Lecture and why we're virtually gathered here today for its sixth edition to listen to this year's distinguished speaker. But before I introduce him, I'd like to thank and pray tribute to Lady Moira Quigley, who supported the Centre's decision to institute these memorial lectures. I would also like to express on behalf of the Centre my gratitude to the Department of Further and Higher Education, Research, Innovation and Science for the funding that, pro that they provide to the Centre, which makes this event, along with many others, possible. Lastly, I would also like to ask you, given that this is a virtual space, to please use the chat function at the bottom of your screen to kind of have those conversations, to, to react, to comment, to share information uh, during this lecture, but also use the Q&A function to place any questions you might ha have, and we'll select as many as we can to, to pose to our speaker at the end of the lecture. It's my absolute pleasure now to introduce this year's speaker who we can count as a long-standing friend of the Centre for Cross-Border Studies, Owen McGuinness. Speaking to us today about renewed interest in developing the potential of the Dublin-Belfast Economic Corridor, uh, Corridor, Owen is ideally placed to bring this cross-border perspective to life. While he is now a senior economist with Ulster University's Economic Policy Centre, and has been one of the team, along with colleagues from Dublin City University, to revisit the potential of this cross-border economic corridor. Owen was previously Policy Research Manage Manager Intertrade Ireland, the All Ireland Trade and Business Development Body, that is one of the six implementation bodies established by the Good Friday Belfast Agreement. Before that, however, among his many other accomplishments, Owen worked at the Centre for Cross-Border Studies, where he contributed to what the centre is today. Hence, it's such a particular pleasure for me to ask Owen McGuinness to deliver the Centre for Cross-Border Studies sixth Sir George Quigley Annual Memorial Lecture entitled, Is it time once again to revisit the idea of a Dublin Belfast Economic Corridor? Over to you, Owen. 
Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Anthony. Um, just myself. And let me just share the screen um, here, if you just bear with me one moment. It's the thing with, with these. I, I'd like to thank Anthony, just as I'm starting here for the kind words, um, and also to his colleague, uh, Mark McClatchy, who's kind of handled the IT um, for us today in terms of the registration, and would echo what Anthony has said in terms of thanking Lady Maura Quigley for her ongoing support for this event. Um, so George Quigley was someone that I met numerous times over the years, and um, I was delighted to be asked to give the memorial lecture today. And, and I would have met him um, when I was a, a student, undergraduate, and then later postgraduate student of history in Queens. He took a great interest um, in that department down the years, and then years later um, in various post um, cross border events, business events, and sort of policy events over the years. Um, and I felt it was kind of natural when I was asked to give the lecture to turn once again to one of the ideas that I think Sir George was most closely associated with in his post-civil service life, and that was um, the Dublin-Belfast Economic Corridor or the Belfast-Dublin Economic Corridor, the North-South Economic Corridor, depending on the audience I suspect he was speaking to. Um, another reason it was natural to come back, um, Anthony mentioned work, and I'd like to pay tribute to colleagues in DCU and UU, um, uh, Neil Blair, Dergo Brin and Jordana Car Carrigan, who all work with me on this project um, that we work with on, on the new initiative uh, with the eight local authorities. And they asked universities for volunteers and we then became the willing volunteers or perhaps not so willing volunteers um, to do that work. And in the lecture, I just wanna briefly sketch out the background factors to the idea of the corridor back in the 1990s. I'll, I'll briefly cover that at the start of the lecture. Um, and I want to make the point, you know, that when it came to, to this idea, as well as many others that Sir George floated over the years, um, ideas certainly mattered to him and research mattered to him. I think anyone who's looked through um, the collection of his, of his speeches at a time to speak that were published posthumously um, would kind of get a good sense of that. Um, but I think, you know, you, you can't, even if you even if you agreed or disagree with the 1976 report he did in the, the Northern Ireland economy, um, which later took his name, the Quigley report, you, even whether you agreed or disagreed with the conclusions of it, the, the intellectual ideas and the framework that he placed around that were very striking for, for a civil service document then or, or at any other time. Um, and I just, you know, so some of this would be around the idea that the corridor held and still holds. Um, Michael Darcy last year in the lecture made an, a, good, um, a good sort of key there argument for reimagining the island economy. Um, I, I'd like to go a wee bit further with this and uh, ask a question really, maybe fair or otherwise, or whether it's it's a reimagining we need to be thinking about or sort of almost like a, a 1980s song, ripping it up and starting again, really, in a sense. So that's I'll come back to that towards the end of the lecture. And I think by, this, by that time when I get then, I think I'd probably be getting to the point that Sir George mentioned in, in himself in a 1991 speech about the island economy, that there was no point in having a neck if you didn't stick it out sometimes. Um, so I think that's where I'll go with that. But I suppose by, by way of introducing the, the topic and the idea, I'll, I'll take you back briefly to the 1990s. And in February 1992, when Sir George first mentioned this idea, you know, when you kind of look back at the newspaper, um, articles or say Fortnite magazine from that month, you, you get a sense of uh, Peter Brook and Charlie Hawhey both resigned in that month, both now almost historical figures in, in some ways, you get a sense of how long ago it was. The North's Industrial Development Board, which is the, the predecessor of Invest NI, um, was reporting that it had no inward investment offers um, or deals to announce in the previous two years, even with a single market coming on stream, it was a difficult time for inward investment. You're in the middle of a major recession at that point. And in terms of kind of the Dublin Belfast rail link, um, Neary train station, which I certainly have used many times over the years, had, had a, well, at that stage was pretty much a shed and had just been bombed um, for one of many times um, in the previous months. It was a very different time in, in 1992 when this idea was first floated. Um, and I think, you know, when, if you think of the background to it, it's, there's a, is to say that there are times were very, very different. You were, 
just about to launch um, in 1992, the single European market. And, and you can see the quote that Sir George used um, at that time. His, his idea was that, you know, if North and South failed miserably to, to do anything coordinated in, on the island itself, um, they would have, you know, signally failed to give give sort of a, some support to the, uh, the idea of the 1992 concept. So much of what his initial thinking was around the island economy and indeed the Dublin Belfast corridor was in around the, the coming of the single market at that time. Um, there were concerns simultaneously, it had to be said around that, around the single market, that in a sense, areas that were already peripheral could become more peripheral, border regions being one, and the island of Ireland as a whole being another. Um, so there was a sense there of you were coming into the new forces of competition and what could you do to catch up and um, never mind stay ahead at that stage. That was something that he was very aware of um, and that lay behind a lot of the idea of the island economy and again the corridor. And I think uh, another thing that was there was that, uh, you know, was a, a sign of how Sir George could pick up on these things. The idea of economic corridors had really become um, come to the fore in the late 80s and early 90s and much of the the argument that was to fo follow picked up on examples out of the US and, and Europe and, and these are things places we still look to for best practice as a mode of combating or avoiding greater divergence between um, peripheral places and core um, centres. Also the kind of the background too was uh, provided by the economic performance and it was a pretty grim time in 19 in the early 1990s I mentioned there a bit recession um, the chart here sort of shows um, in the green line, um, and this is taken from John Fitzgerald, Negra Morganos paper um, uh, from last year. And I, you can kind of see there the convergence that took place in the 1990s between the Irish economy and the EU. You use the black line across the middle there, the 100, and the UK um, economy. So there was a time of convergence period of the Celtic Tiger, um, obviously. But just as this, this um, idea was being floated back in 1992, things were much um, grimmer. Unemployment on both sides of the border was well into double figures. Um, and in a sense, when Sir George gave the um, Charles Carter lecture, where he starts to really float the ideas of cross-border, greater levels of cross-border um, coordination and cooperation, he, he makes the point that Joe Lee's um, History of Ireland, Modern Ireland, had just been published um, a couple of years before. And if you read that book, it was an absolute laceration of begrudgery uh, and indeed other things that Lee felt were was holding were holding particularly the south of Ireland back but it could have equally been applied to the north um, at that time. The questions about the Northern Ireland economy you know varied at that stage in the early 90s between the rancorous of who was more employed and what unemployed I should say and why um, and other issues there really about attempts to be optimistic but the, the IDB numbers as I say, it probably showed how difficult that was. Um, some forecasts at that time was that to actually get to uh, uh, an unemployment rate in Northern Ireland of 10% by 2000 would take um, annual average growth rate of 5%, which it certainly didn't re reach uh, unemployment in many ways, I think was a, more of a reclassification um, of people as the unemployment rate went down over that um, period. So that's kind of the, the economic performance background. It was a, a case of delayed convergence, certainly for the South, the North just um, trundling along um, to some degrees. And this was all a, a, against a background like the single market, a background really of globalization. Um, I think I'm third wave, I think of globalization and much of the indicators there were of a, a kind of a trade openness, um, reductions in transport and communications cost. This is the, the decade in which um, certainly internet access and access to computers, personal computers, mobile phones and so on really took off. And those costs of getting goods from A to B um, began to fall quite dramatically. Um, and it, there was a lot of talk at this time. And I think coming back to the corridor, there was a lot of talk at the end of geography. You know, we didn't have to think about geography or place. There was the death of distance. We lived in a borderless world, if you were to believe that at that time. And a sense that borders and, and you know, state-based orders were being replaced in a, by new forces in, in a hyper-globalized world. And economic corridors, I think, fed into or arose out of that type of thinking. Locally, um, we were also at a, at a time where there was um, very, very poor transport infrastructure. I mentioned um, the Dublin-Belfast 
um, enterprise service that was just getting on the go at that point. The road infrastructure was also very poor at that at that stage. So there was plenty of work to be done um, in terms of that connectivity question um, along the corridor um, at the point. So that's really the background, if you like, um, to the that idea at that time. And in a sense, maybe gives you a, a sense of where Sir George was coming from. And I'll come back to you know to to this towards the end. But what I want to do um, now is take you maybe through um, briefly some of the results of the research that myself and, and colleagues did, um, what we found in profiling the corridor, and then what we thought might be some of the potential next steps. So if you bear with me, I'll take you through some of this and then come back to more, more general points towards the end. Um, I suppose the first thing to say that, you know, we, for the purposes of what we looked at as the economic corridor or, or that region um, between Dublin and Belfast, or uh, depending on what way you're, you're looking down, down or up um, the corridor, we, we took the, an administrative geography position really to take the council areas that um, straddle, I suppose, the, the road and rail infrastructure. You could have easily included Monaghan and perhaps North Ards and North Down in that, but the, we've eight local authorities that came together in that initiative have come together with the two universities to see what might be done. So for the purposes of our research and the purpose of the profile, um, there was the eight, eight local authorities, as I say, on either side of the road and rail infrastructure that we did. So you're talking, you know, taking it from the south up. Um, apologies. Um, you're talking from uh, the south upwards, um, Dublin through Fingal, Meath, Louth, then engineering morning down, um, ABC, Armagh, Armagh City, Banbridge and Craig Avon, um, and up into Lisburn and Castlereagh and finally Belfast City. So that's the, the, the drive of the corridor um, between the two. And as I said, it's maybe two interesting things to say that are, are kind of interesting on, on that before getting to the profile. One is probably a big change since the 1990s, and that is the role local authorities uh, as executive bodies have begun to take in, in this space. Maybe that's a legacy of the Interreg um, programme since the 90s, where local authorities in East Border region uh, and elsewhere um, have come to the fore in terms of cross-border cooperation. It's also probably, I think, um, something to do with the changing remits of local authorities and taking um, a wider role around things like employability, um, innovation, you think of things like the Belfast City, uh, Belfast Region City deal, and, and those um, some of the ideas around spatial planning um, south of the border too that are coming to the fore. And secondly, I suppose there was an interest, at least initially, in what might be done around upgrading the, the rail connection. Um, so that's that's probably where the local authorities came to the fore. And I suppose what we found um, here, I, I'm looking at in terms of the strengths. What we found that much of that. Um, much of that has been a kind of sense of the historical development patterns along the eastern seaboard. So there's a, a sense here of, of um, relative success being built upon, um, I think, over the period. You know, there's always been a, a strong concentration of um, population and population growth along this region, probably around now sort of 2.1, 2.2 million and expected to reach, you know, another half million on top of that. In the next um, 15 or so years. So there's a, a continued concentration of growth. And in, in some senses, the, the issue being that growth is kind of almost peri urban to the two cities. So what might be done or to the cities themselves? Um, a good um, attractiveness to FDI has always been the case, I think, with Belfast and Dublin at either end of it. But in between places over the, the last number of years, I think, is some of the um, you think in Louth and Dundalk and Drogheda, quite a lot of um, FDI going in there and into other parts of County Meath as well. Um, also, some of those other things that are there, I'll come back to the question about um, clustering and agglomeration economies later on. Obviously, the connections to the, the outside world of ports and airports, the assets that are there um, along the corridor are quite striking. And then there's the whole question of educational attainment. Now, this is a mixed picture, but you still have a situation where you know, more than a third of the residents along the corridor have um, uh, third level qualifications or higher than that. So it's a well, well educated, well skilled um, population and a good pipeline then for for the concentration of jobs requiring graduates. So, you know, buoyant labour market, I suppose all those things combined to that, at least in, you know, on the edge of COVID or on the 
Brink when COVID struck, and I'll come back to the point of COVID later. Um, but at that point, you had round about um, you know uh, nine hundred seventy thousand residents of the corridor um, in employment, and more than a million jobs along the corridor being there. So that in itself pulls in commuters and and others off the corridor into the space. The sectors then in terms of the sectoral strengths along the corridor, there's a big influence there of FDI focus naturally, um, but there's been prevailing traditions really there, industrial traditions along um, the area, tourism being a key one, but agri-food also in a number of those council areas. And then there's the city effects, big concentrations in education, like higher education um, in particular, and in public administration, there were many civil service jobs. Um, at least in, in, in essence or there, although many of us working remotely now, there, there may be opportunities for, for other smaller towns to, to benefit from that, where people don't have to commute into the two city centres every day. So there's, there's a bit of the, that, but there's also a question, I think, of how specialised the corridor is compared to other parts of the island. In employment terms, certainly in tradable services, you can, you can see it there. You think of the IFSC, you think of... Um, Things like financial technology, cybersecurity, those sorts of tradable services that are that are there, and there's good sectoral strengths and research strengths going there. Less so probably in production subsectors, and this is the point that you know John Bradley and, and others have made that in a sense the industrial structures on, on uh, you know are are quite different north and south, and that has been one of the the obstacles or one of the things that needs to be grappled with in terms of greater levels of, of cross-border cooperation, business cooperation. And I think another um, point I would make here is that it, when we kind of think of much talk of smart or, or wise specialization as the, as the Germans or intelligent specialization as the Germans would see it, um, mixed engagement, uh, mixed evidence of engagement in this on, on both parts of the end, much in terms of kind of top down that, but less so in terms of engagement from the bottom up from business and, and, and others in that. And I think, there's a strong need both on the corridor and elsewhere on the island to focus and choose what we do, what, what we are specialised in um, and can compete on that basis. And I think places are very different. You know, I think the, there is a need to kind of hone in on that a little bit more. At the same time, I'm, I'd be pretty sure, um, evidence to the contrary, that every place cannot be world class in the same things. I think that's that's something that's um, needs to be grappled with. You know, we do need to move away from that fear of focus. I think, um, in sense of what we do. So, in a say, in a sense, there has been much change um, along the corridor since the nineties. I don't think anybody who was travelling by road or rail now would say as, as a, a similar experience to what they would have had back in the nineteen nineties. Um, you look at the connectivity now out of Dublin Airport, now allowing for the kind of the the restrictions at the moment, but in general, in terms of the routes. Um, out of Dublin and to a lesser extent the other airports along the corridor um, it's you know the connectivity there is much broader and wider than it would have been in terms of uh, visitor numbers coming onto the island but also in terms of, of where we can get to off the island is much different to the 1990s unemployment rates at least up before COVID um, were much lower um, in, in both parts as well than they had been back 30 years ago. And then there's the uh, peace, or at least relative peace, I suppose, in many ways. But, you know, certainly a, a very different place than it was before the ceasefires and the Good Friday Agreement. And in terms of the corridor, there has been, um, as I say, some things remain the same, but there's been quite a, quite a distinct level of change where the population is young, always was, but it's much more diverse. And, and, and as I mentioned before, the levels of educational attainment are, are greater than they, they were in the past. The diversity, I think, is a is a, is a key thing now in, in terms of when we looked at this on the corridor, 15% of the population um, in the eight council areas were born off the island. So a, a very different population um, a mix than you would have seen. And that has thrown up its, its issues both for host communities, but also for newcomers coming to the island. Um, I think the, the various articles by Sorka Pollock over the last couple of years would, would in the Irish Times would give you a good sense of, of what that's been like for, for some of uh, those new people coming to live and, and grow up and, and indeed raise families um, on the corridor or elsewhere. I think there's cross-border trade has been much enhanced since the 1990s. Um, you know, it's a uh, it's well, uh, you know, it's well over the doubling of that since the, the 1990s. And there's talk 
that it could double again. I think there are certainly opportunities there, but I'd like to see us sort of think a bit when we think about cooperation a bit beyond cross border trade itself, sometimes with a broader off island goal in mind, and sometimes also about what are other gains that can be made for cooperation than, than, than trade alone. Um, would have been a point that was often made to me when I was in Inter Trade Ireland by, by colleagues there is to think about the beyond the trade gains really um, for that. And I, I think that's an important point. A significant, very significant expansion of research and innovation led centres really since the, the 90s. And I think the, if you think even just recently, the announcements around the screen and media innovation lab in Belfast, the biotech innovation centre that Monaghan it would be um, located in Monaghan and then an advanced manufacturing centre in Dundalk and all three of those um, will hold good opportunities I think for businesses along there. The need for coordination of effort probably being the next step um, between those centres and you know uh, possible client companies um, right across the corridor or right across the island more generally. Um, when we talk about clustering and come back to this um, I think there's less evidence that might be expected, should be expected, or sometimes even believed um, when, we, when we talk about uh, clusters. There's proximity there, certainly in, in, in kinds of um, sectoral ecosystems there, but I'll, I'll come back to this point later. I think um, much more needs to be done in that space. So plenty has changed over time, I suppose, in, in essence, um, but there are, there are many things that you know, have re remained um, similar. And some of the things that have changed, and again, when we look at challenges, what we found in the research was there, there are things that have new challenges to add to the old ones that we've struggled to solve. If we deal with the new ones, COVID and the recovery from that is probably the most pressing one that, that we think of. And it, you know, with vaccination programs, with um, the, the reopening, the gradual reopening, I, I suppose, of society and, and the economy, we're beginning to see um, hopefully uh, uh, sort of a, a recovery that can be sustained um, throughout the rest of this year. But there is pressing issues around that. COVID has had enormous effects, significant effects, um, particularly on younger people, but also on, on the elderly there. There's been many people who've been put on furlough or lost their jobs. I think you take that as a bit of an index of where we are. We're much lower in terms of the pop payments and in terms of those on wage subsidy supports both sides of the border. But we're not where we were last September. We still have a way to go um, before we can declare ourselves out of the woods, even um, at the at that uh, medium point, really. So that's there's a fair direction there to go. And I think in terms of that recovery, um, I'm struck by Mark Carney's recent point on that is that when we think about the longer term recovery, a key question to ask ourselves, I think, coming out of COVID, is is it the quality and indeed the direction of growth that are more important than its actual rate of growth. So that, that could be an important point, I think, to think of when we're thinking about the, these kind of acute challenges we're facing. Brexit, I, you know, um, I was hoping to duck this, but it's, it's, it's almost impossible um, to duck the question of Brexit and indeed now how we might exploit the Northern Ireland Protocol. Those are also pre a pressing issue. And in some ways, much of this was preordained by um, as a sense by you know, the decision that was taken, um, the exit door that was taken by the UK government. If you, a soft Brexit was going to be a very different, um, was going to have disruption, but was going to have a very significant, different level of significance in terms of the um, disruption that would happen than the, the exit door that has been chosen. And I think around that question, the protocol then comes in into the question of how closely the UK will choose or not to be aligned um, with EU rules. That's going to be the crux of the matter around the Northern Ireland Protocol. I still believe there's opportunities there, but in a sense, um, playing that in a very you know, soft voice um, approach seems to be the way at the moment um, on the northern side of the border, which strikes me as a, a way to ensure that the opportunities are not only missed, but pass elsewhere. So I think that has to be grappled with. We obviously then have the acute crisis that is there already really with the climate emergency and much of that that will be thrown up and that was something we we looked at in the report about what um that might mean in terms of both mitigation and in terms of other kind of um, low carbon transformation there and then there's i think there's a very intense problem probably one of the most intense problems i think around um, public policy at the moment and that is housing and accommodation it's particularly striking I, I, in a sense um, on the corridor 
um, given kind of the prices and affordability issues there around rent and um, house prices. And that probably is, is going to be one of those ones that will, will remain, it can be solved over time. But I think like the first three there that I mentioned, the need for coordination is going to be critical in that both along the corridor and on a cross-border basis um, also. There's the endemic issues there, and these are issues that haven't gone away really since the 90s. Um, the divergence in economic performance north between the north and the south remains so, and, and the diverging um, industrial structure, I think, is, is another issue which makes cooperation that bit more tricky. Um, and then I think, again, a lack of sort of industrial policy coordination has been endemic really um, since that. And in some senses, there's a kind of a, a, a broad alignment, but almost by accident and um, by times, I think, in that space. There's a mismatch um, of skills demand and stock and supply that are there still, even with the high levels of educational attainment. I think there's sometimes a mismatch in the areas in which skills are um, gathered. I think there's probably much more to be made out of transferable um, skills that are there. If you think of someone like Sir George, um, a history graduate, a uh, history PhD student back in the 1950s, and the way he was able to kind of transfer those skills into other areas throughout his um, civil service and later post-civil service career is a, is a good example of what transferable skills actually look like in practice. But that is a, a still an issue there around that mismatch. And then there's the challenge, and this is a, a, a ongoing and one we, we have because of our success in FDI, there's the question of what do we do about indigenous SMEs? How can we make those more competitive um, and indeed export led? So those remain challenges there, I think, for us. In terms of the, one of the things we did look at was what we might learn from economic corridors elsewhere. And there's probably a couple of things here, really. One is that the corridors as originally in, envisaged were largely transport led um, and end to end transport led. And that remains a, remains a, a an issue there. There's no doubt about that. I think um, whatever position you take on the Dublin Belfast train, for instance, whether it's high speed, mid speed, low speed, one of the things that certainly needs to be, um, I think, um, addressed is the regularity of the service um, and, the, and the reliability of the service. So I think those are certainly um, things there that the train service, as it currently stands, is not particularly fit for purpose um, to, to uh, you know, connect two cities of the size that are there. But in many ways, corridors have moved on from that. The diagram at the bottom will kind of talk to you about sort of a bit moving from a basic transport corridor up to an economic corridor and much of that around softer infrastructure and inward investment as, as time has passed on. And I think that's the direction in which the proposals coming for the Dublin Belfast corridor will go. Part of that, if you, if you look at the corridors elsewhere, and we looked in Europe, um, we looked at some of the Asian examples and some of the US, North American um, examples, and much of it is moving into the, the kind of softer infrastructure and the, the attraction of, of investment into it. So it's promotion, if you think of the um, Morrisund area and the sort of medical triangle there in terms of medical devices, it's much about branding a growth region, but there's also about um, creating those additional regional complementarities and clusters and research and, and innovation and, and that focus on, on those complementarities. So the capability development piece um, there, that's the other part that corridors have moved into. And you can see that around um, one of the crux of it is how do how can you actually um, encourage and accelerate the flows of knowledge back and forward across a corridor? So I think that's going to be the real challenge. Um, and it comes back to that whole issue around sort of proximity um, that, I, that I'll return to um, towards the end. In terms of where the corridor, the Belfast corridor is at at the moment, it has identified some opportunity areas for cooperation, as you can see, which do take it along that line, I think, um, towards that sort of um, softer infrastructure, um, if you like, and the sort of the, the knowledge flows and the capability development and promotion um, piece that many corridors are now moving. The initiative itself, you know, along among the eight councils and other stakeholders is, is very much at that sort of know the interest cross-border territory know each other within the territory stage um, and there's plenty of engagement to be done there the councils are beginning that process of, of engagement but, but know they need to do that more widely um, over the next number of months good launch happened back in March and that momentum now being built upon and then a discussion about 
if you were choosing between those opportunity areas, which would be more important? And I think the factors and criteria um, that would lie behind that have to be around, you know, what additionality will be brought by partnership within the corridor and actually working in a space like um, our, our DNA centers of excellence, what, what, what could the partnership bring to that would, would, would be additional? What are the, and these are the questions that were there on the corridor all along, what are the, um, what's the distributional effects both along the corridor itself, but also across the island as a whole of investment in some of these things in that Dublin Belfast um, region? What's the rationale for local government to pursue these as well as others um, as well? So there's, there's, there's things there. And above all, I, I think, and I'll come back, uh, I'll stress this point really, is the need for a framework for coordination for all of this. We, we they, back in the 2000s, there were a lot of work done around a sort of framework for spatial, for coordination and cooperation and spatial planning. And unfortunately sort of came out just as the, the Great Recession was breaking, but that could be returned to, I think, as a, as a very good um, framework, really, for the cooperation effects in, in a sort of functional area or functional region. So what Sir George might make of it now, um, and I'm conscious now, just really, it's a couple of slides just to finish out um, here. I think when, I, when you go through, if you, people have had the chance to ever have a look at the group I mentioned earlier, the time to speak, and it was a collection of um, speeches and reflections um, on this post-civil service life. The level of background reading and th thinking that went into those is quite striking, really. It wasn't, these were not off-the-cuff speeches. And Leda Mora and Vidya Barua made that point very strongly in the introduction to that and highlighted his, his absolutely voracious reading habits, really, there. And it was he certainly he brought the, much of the latest historical economic and management thinking to bear on. on on a lot of the thinking, and I think on the corridor itself, it's much more than just mature reflection, really, I, I think, and um, when you look at it. Um, so I think that's an important point. Ideas certainly matter to Sir George. Um, one quote that he, he often used was that um, economic ideas were, were very important to him. Um, he would have used this quote, that, this, sorry, this quote that we have from Keynes there. Um, and it just highlight maybe three things that, that would have been strongly held views, I think, of Sir George at that time, um, and right up to 2013 from the last one. There was a belief there of a, um, a, that a dynamic pub, private sector, and in a sense, markets without border could prove a key element for, for the car. That was very much a sort of a, a feeling of the, the 1990s. And Sir George was very much taken with in, you know, industrial or enterprise policy based on the ideas of Michael Porter, the likes of the Culloden Report, and around that about cooperation, clustering, networking, those types of ideas, and the management school's ideas of Tom Peters and others were around about collaboration on various um, things. And a later thinker there, I think, that he, he came to was that of Michael Best and the whole innovation and capability um, perspective, which I think is critical to any thinking around um, clustering or, or indeed collaboration. He also had a very strong, and the second point there, very strong in understanding um, given a kind of a, a broader view that I think he took, and many of us don't always take, of the peripherality, I think, of the island, and indeed the peripherality of some parts of the island, um, and what needed to be done to address that in terms of in, you know, when you were looking in the new single market at that time, um, uh, how, how the island of Ireland and how um, different parts might compete within that new single market. But that was always tempered by, a, 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 I think, a an optimism about convergence. So George always had those, was on the one hand, on the other hand, view of things. Um, and he, he picked up on that idea of the borderless world, Kenichi Omai and others, I think, at, at that time. So there was that optimism there about the benefits that could come from that, from globalization. Yes, you, there would be competition, but there was an opportunity to compete at the same time. And I think the third thing, it was a, a later comment from 2013, is that he, ha he had a strong sense that looking back, over those 20 years, the interdependence of both parts of the island was forcing itself um, on public attention. I think that was something that he, he believed that the, a broader view um, that economic cooperation could soften some of the divides between North and South and perhaps even within Northern Ireland itself. So it was kind of an interdependence view of things uh, that I think was very strong within him. And just finally then, you know, I, I said I would come back to sticking my neck out. So, I'll do that really in this 
last slide uh, to some extent. And I, th I think about um, John Bradley's comment back in 2012 when he was talking about um, looking at Irish industrial uh, industrial policy south of the border. And he, he quoted from Frank O'Connor, the court porn writer, who said that to do something like that, you'd, well, he was talking about writing in, in censorship Ireland in the 30s and 40s and talked about to do it, you needed the, the height of a rhino, rhinoceros and to have a house, house located with an exit to the sea, I think was a, a, a wise advice. So bear with me perhaps on this last slide. And the first question I'd ask is that, what do the ideas of the 1990s still hold? The brief answer to that would be to some extent, but not as much, um, I wouldn't be over relying um, on these. And I think in, we, we cannot be enthralled to some of those ideas um, or hope that's with some tweaks um, to say the models of business or macroeconomic models that we can just continue on as before. Um, I think Sir George by this stage, um, had he been still with us, I think would have started to look more strongly elsewhere than just those ideas of the 1990s. He would have been looking at geography and um, history and you know psychology for some of the, the, the ideas of, of what we might do for newer ways of thinking about the corridor or about the island economy more generally. I think three things really have changed in, in the 1990s. We've moved from the borderless world idea to um, bringing borders back in. And, and a particular tribute, I think, to um, the work of Liam O'Dowd and Katie Hayward in, in that space. I think they've given us a great understanding of how that has actually happened and what the significance of that is that we're, we're no longer, you know, and I think if you, if you look at deglobalization more generally since 2013, that wave of globalization that was there in the 90s has, in some cases, as Douglas Irwin might call it, it's kind of globalization now or a trend um, for that to reverse slightly. And I think that's an important um, point really to bear in mind. Another one that I think, and I mentioned geography there, places come back into vogue. And I think that's um, very important uh, to think about. Balanced regional development is there, I think, to make a case for something like a, a Dublin Belfast card or initiative, you, you have to kind of bear in mind that there are plenty of other spaces there and places across the island. There's a border corridor, there's the, the Northwest work, there's the Atlantic Economic Corridor as well. So it's it's one of a many um, of a number of different initiatives there and will have to um, grapple for its place within that. So um, place and geography are now back in vogue. And finally, you know, on that in terms of Institutions are probably seen as much more important now than they were back in the 1990s. Um, I think globalization and, and the single market made us think these things were less important. Um, but in a sense, now we were kind of past that or in that peak of peak globalization or return, as I said, to deglobalizing perhaps. We're looking at closer supply chains, we're looking at nearshoring, we're looking at turn, a turn to rely more on our own institutions and structures. So what this means for cross-border flows um, and cooperation, I think, is, is something to be thought about that. But these things are certainly back in play. So in terms of that, if you think about that, what may be the basis of new proposals, I think casting them or doing them on the basis of where we were in the 1990s, or indeed some of the ideas that Sir George would have there, won't take us too far. So I think we need to kind of think about what what we might need to now address. One first thing I would say is we, we really need seriously need to grapple with proximity. We have had the view, and I think that's right, that we're a small island and everywhere is proximate to one another. That is probably true, but there are different types of proximity I think we need to grapple with. Um, I'm thinking here, Chris Van Egret, the likes of Eleanor Doyle and others have, have given us some insights into what that might look like, but I think that's an important point. There are institutional proximity, there's cognitive proximity, there's social proximity and interactions that are as critical as geographical proximity. So grappling with that, I think, is a, is a key thing. Secondly, we, we probably need to get serious about clusters and sector ecosystems, um, more so than perhaps we, we have been to date. We've made some steps there, but I think the one thing we need to avoid is the five simple steps approach to it that, you know, we too can be Silicon Valley. Again, going back to that point, we need to be kind of cognizant of place. We need to be thinking about what it is we're specialized in and kind of cluster in. And we need to think about scale in that if we're going to try and compete off the island as well. And the third point, and this is a point that's not new, but again, I don't think has ever really been grappled with fully um, since the 90s. And it's a point that <clears throat> John Bradley made in response to the Dublin Belfast Corridor back then. 
the place for coordination, I think, in, in all of this. Where will that coordination come from? Where does it lie? How consistent um, will it be? I think if you if you take a sense with the Belfast corridor, there's always been a, a point of, well, sure, there's not it's either a case if you're critical of it, there's nothing to see here, would be the one argument, or the other thing is, well, there's no market failure, but it'll happen by itself. Those generally have tend to be the arguments for um the corridor and the wider island economy and indeed cross-border cooperation more generally. Um, I, I would argue that there's there's plenty of failure there and coordination it, it will be needed in that. And I think it's painstaking work that has to be done and indeed um sometimes difficult, but it probably means policy coordination in a number of areas. I mentioned earlier about the, the framework for cooperation and spatial planning. I think that would be a good place to start, but it's an area I think we need to get quite serious about. And I'll leave it at that. I think that's my sort of um, 35 minutes up. So I'll leave it at that point. And I think Anthony, I'll kind of happily share these slides after the lecture is done. Thank you so much, Sean. Th thank you. Thank you for, for confirming that you, you'd be happy for that, those those slides to be shared. Uh, I can tell you that people have been asking exactly that, that question. Uh, and actually the recording of this um, entire webinar will, will be available to people afterwards. But thank you, Owen, so, really for a, a, a really interesting, a really um, in-depth look there at, at the context uh, uh, around the Dublin Belfast Economic Corridor. And I can tell you we've got a lot of questions, so we're not going to be able to, to answer all of them, but I'll try it. We'll try and go through as many of them as possible. So I'm going to start um, actually with, uh, with with Chris, who has a question which actually touches a few people have touched on this. It's around the, the how the double in Belfast corridor, it might it, it, it makes a lot of sense. But how does it relate to the idea of balanced regional development in the context, for example, of the national planning framework in, in the south? Is the promotion of the corridor not always going to go against this idea of balanced regional development? Um, that that that's do you want to tackle that one? And just 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 before you do, just to mention that a few people have actually mentioned this idea or, or the issue of balanced regional development. And people have also raised there's a few questions here about the Northwest. What about the Northwest? What about uh, a, a, a dairy Sligo economic corridor. So would you just like to perhaps answer that that, that question? Yeah, I, I think, um, I, I suppose my, my take on this is that it's, it's you know, all, there's there's no problem. I think I, I'm somebody who's been a, a great advocate, I think of the border corridor or the, the border region idea as well. So I think there's place for a number of these almost simultaneously. The key thing, will be then of, you know, what, what two things I suppose uh, about it will be, I think in terms of the balanced region of development, one will be the specializations that different places have and can bring to bear um, on that, which is not always easy because I think many of us want to be specialized in the same things. I think if you do a specialization program, we all come up with sort of similar sectors. Um, and there are things that are ubiquitous right across the yeah, island, I'm thinking agri-food or indeed tourism. But there are other things where there are specialisations there that will need to be kind of pursued in that fashion um, and, and need to be done in a sort of serious fashion in the areas in which we find them. I think the second point I would make on, on the sort of balanced regional development is much of that has to come down to, um, you know, the provision of, of what are now almost basic public goods and services um, to, to different areas. Uh, to allow those areas to kind of thrive as as best they can. So I, I when I kind of one of the things I think you'll find uh, I would avoid in terms of kind of arguing for an infrastructure, you know, huge infrastructure investment in the Dublin Belfast corridor on its own. I think the you know there's there's a, a good argument for that spread of public goods and indeed um, softer infrastructural investment across um, a number of spaces or a number of places and spaces if you like um, therein I think lies the kind of the balance of regional development the question of kind of you know the concentration of um, I think the Ireland 2040 makes a very good point of you know it, it's about kind of allowing secondary cities if you like or second tier um, cities may not like it to be called that but in a sense that you know outside of Dublin I guess, um, to kind of thrive and indeed to act as a counterbalance um, to Dublin. I think 
with with support for the likes of the Atlantic Economic Corridor or, or indeed um, the Northwest Partnership, I, I think those could those could allow cases to be made for that. So I don't believe it's kind of exclusive growth in one way or another, nor I think, and, and this would be one of the things I would be critical of the ideas of the 90s, that it's a case that if Dublin and Belfast corridor um, thrives, that it lifts all boats equally. I wouldn't believe in that argument either. So I think there's a, there is a need for that counterbalance. Um, oh, when you, 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 at the end there, when you were talking about thinking ahead, how, how do we think about the, the new context? You talked about di thinking about proximity in a different, in a, in perhaps in a different way. Uh, and, and this kind of touches on that. It's from Mary Casey in, in, in terms of that proximity. Is it around this new era for US-UK relations? Uh, is there potential for the Atlantic Charter to set up Northern Ireland as a corridor for, the, for these relationships of thinking about Northern Ireland in, in, a, in a different space? Yeah, I suppose, I mean, it, we need a, Mary's, Mary's argument's a, a good one. I, I think a proximity is not just a sort of geographical um, question or, or indeed even that we're kind of midway in there, well, we're not, we're not midway through the Atlantic, but we're on, you know, in that kind of line of um, between um, North America and, and the UK. But I think there's, so there's, there's a broader question around proximity that I, I, I think we need to sort of think a little bit about. Um, but there is an opportunity there around the Northern Ireland Protocol. I, I suspect that's that has been there, you know, in terms of potential for inward investment. Um, we're now the only. You know, we're now in another part of of. We're we're now in that part of the islands, if you like, the, the of the British Isles. That's within the the EU um, single market. So there's plenty of opportunity there. I think for Northern Ireland to position itself in that. Perhaps also even for. Um, a country or companies, I should say, based in GB that could use Northern Ireland as a, as a way of accessing the, the single market also. So I think there's there's ways of thinking about, about it there. That the Northern Ireland as a bridge between the two has certainly been been there in the past. If you think of the John Hume uh, work around with Boston um, and, and other kind of, uh, you know, efforts and initiatives like that, this is something that's been tried and has worked quite successfully in, in the past. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't, um, Dismiss it. I think that's a, a, all these things need to be tried. What about, here's another thing to, to perhaps tr try. This is from David O'Doherty. Uh, his question is Would an overarching All Island Research and Innovation Council assist in enhancing cooperation between centres as well as cluster and networks? Um, well, it, uh, it's good to hear from Dermot. Dermot's a, a former colleague of mine. And, and um, in, in an answer, in, in a word, yes, it would, Dermot. I think that um, it's one of those things that's possibly we've tweaked at and tinkered with um, over, over the years. I think there was good work done on things like um, Horizon 2020 in terms of promoting, um, bringing sort of particularly Northern Ireland partners into, uh, into benefit out of the success rate of, of um, universities and, and institutes of technology in the South. In terms of Horizon 2020 and previous EU research programs, I think there's there's still plenty of space for that. Uh, something that actually looks at a research prioritisation, a council that did that across the island. Yes, I think that would be of of great benefit. I I, I think in in general, I've come, come around more and more to the idea that we, you know, we need to not worry less about picking winners and worry more about a fear of any focus. I think we, that prioritization is is absolutely necessary for us. And, and here's a, a, a question from Rosalind, and it's where do you see tertiary education playing a role in, in the development of, of these cross-border economic corridors? Well, it's a, it's a good question, Rosalind. I mean, certainly um, you have, I think you've found really over, possibly over, over the last, you know, number of decades where, where universities have been brought more, they're seen as potential partners in, in many of these things. I, I think, um, I think of the, if you think of the new, um, I say the, I think it's the Bioresearch Institute that's coming into Monaghan, um, Queens are a partner in that um, with, you know, with the kind of Monaghan County Council there. So councils and other partners naturally enough now look to um, universities as potential partners, particularly if there's a research or innovation or indeed even skills development um, role within the initiative. I think the question for the universities is one of um, 
uh, an ability to be able to respond to that. Um, the universities, naturally enough, have a kind of core um, activity there around teaching and um, academic research. So it's kind of thinking about, you know, how universities can be brought to the table and actually even allowed to be given the resources to be able to bring something to the table themselves. So I think that there's something there. I think if you speak to the universities, they're pulled this way and that way, um, often without kind of resources being there to, to allow them to do that. Uh, speaking of universities, I'm, I'm going to ask a question here. It comes from Dagmar Sheik, once of Queen's University, but has now moved to the tropics of the University of Cork, uh, University College Cork. And she actually raises a point. It's um, isn't it the fact that the UK and Ireland has no longer both been in the EU is going to hamper development because the protocol does not cover services and it doesn't doesn't really cover the, the free movement of people, i.e. non-Irish, non-UK citizens, and the, that, that might hamper things, but really the protocol is around goods. Uh, we don't have, um, you know, the, 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 the single market in terms of services. We don't, we no longer have access to that. Yeah, that, that's the crux. So, uh, you know, Dagmar's right on that. It's, it's, um, it's, a, it's a kind of selective um, thing which to deal with sort of checks on goods coming in and out of, um, coming in and out of Northern Ireland. Um, and that's, that was kind of the, the, it's a slimmed down version really of it. And that down the road, there will be a choice, I think, for 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 Northern Ireland, for the politicians there, and, and indeed for for businesses there, as to which which is which is more important in the longer run um, to them is to try and develop broader and greater or a deeper links there within the single market and all those things like movement of people or indeed um, trade in services. Will they have to do that sort of independently or or piggyback some of the deals there? Or will it be a question of, you know, holding on to the east-west relations, prioritizing those, I should say, over, over the kind of the um inside the, the EU? I don't think I think possibly that question hasn't been grappled with yet, given all the other questions that are there, but that's certainly a that's certainly a fair point to make. I'm afraid we're running out of, of time, but I'm gonna I'm gonna just put in it here another one and it's from Hilary Moran she, she actually had to leave but she's left a question and as we're answering this and, and the, the recording will be available afterwards she she'll be able to watch this back and in fact but somebody else has asked a similar question it's around the fintech corridor yeah. uh, and how that's really a, a good example of a rapidly growing cluster from Dublin to Belfast and, uh, and pr proving how cross-border collaboration can work uh, what are the eight councils plans to work with organizations like the fintech corridor do you know uh, as, as you know as far as I, as far as i know in terms of the discussions that have happened i mean I, I know there's been you know some contact um there's been plenty of contact there i think between some of the councils and hillary and, and the fintech people so there there's initial ideas there i think with things that are already in existence like the fintech corridor i think the initiative will will probably be there as almost like a clearinghouse or at least a, perhaps a promotion um, for some of the clusters that are already there or, and hopefully a kind of a, an attempt to sort of hold them out as the good practice that's there um, to other potential clusters. So I suspect they're well-placed, the FinTech corridor, they've got themselves well up and going. Um, they, probably the crux for, for them as, as for other clusters will be the, the further development of these where do they want to go next is it a kind of a skills academy or is it you know something that's a kind of more of a research center that they they operate out of uh, as a kind of a interlocutor between business and and higher education and, and researchers or what what might it be you know so i think that's 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 going to be the big question is where does the fincat corridors people are in the cluster if you like see itself in a couple of years um, time, I suspect in that space almost as an intermediary or interlocutor is the key. And I think when you look at cluster management organizations, those in Europe that have succeeded well have been those who become specialized, specialized in um, cluster management, as opposed to being just experts in the sector in which they operate. Thank you so much, Owen. And, and, and thank you to everybody who, who joined us today. Um, I'd like to uh, thank Owen for being uh, 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 to give this lecture the sixth.
annual Sir George Quigley Memorial Lecture. Um, um, but I'd just like to leave you with uh, an announcement before you go. It's um, just to tell you that we are about to open the second quarterly survey on the conditions for North, South and East, West cooperation that the Centre for Cross-Border Studies is running, which is a survey that we run in order to, 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 to look at the intensity, the nature of cooperation, uh, especially amongst uh, civic society organisations and local authorities, both on a North, South basis between the two jurisdictions on the island of Ireland, but also between organisations and local authorities on the island of Ireland and Great Britain. Um, so that survey and, and it, the link to the survey is just put there in the chat function. So I just wanted to, 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 to ask you, please, to if you can, to respond to that survey, uh, a really important survey for us to, to just track where we are in terms of cooperation following the implementation of the protocol uh, and in order for us to support that cooperation going forward. Um, we, uh, unfortunately, this is an online event, but I think it, it, it Owen is a pro, it, it, an absolute pro at that. He, it, was, it was seamless. So thank you so much, Owen, for doing that for us. Um, the recording will be made available later. The slides uh, obviously will be made available later as well to, to everybody uh, uh, that, that attended here today. So it, once again, I'd like to thank you all for, for being here with us today. i uh, like Owen for, uh, um, to thank Owen for giving this lecture today. and ask you all to stay in touch with the Centre for Cross-Border Studies and also our flagship uh, project, Border People Project. We always like to hear from you, always there to try and help and to support North-South cooperation, no matter what, going forward. So thank you, everybody. Have a pleasant day. It's happy Friday to, to, from me to you all. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Thanks, everyone.